Okay. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. See, you guys are rolling in pretty quickly today. Everybody's eager to learn to join this education session. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Welcome to today's uh, education session on cancer immunotherapy. We've got an interesting hour planned for the for, well, for the next hour for you guys. My name is Gloria Lausch. I'm the virtual program coordinator here at Gildas Club Greater Toronto. And before we get into what you're really here for, I'm going to run through some housekeeping with you guys. So just a couple of things I want you to be aware of. Throughout the presentation, there will be opportunity to ask our wonderful presenters any questions that are burning in your mind. Uh, we do ask, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a cute little bubble with two chat bubbles. That's the Q&A. Any questions throughout the presentation that you have, please put them in the Q&A box. That's where they'll be looking. They will be answered throughout. Um, if your question doesn't get answered right away, there is going to be dedicated time at the end as well. So don't worry, no need to fret. Your questions will be answered at some point in the presentation. So Q&A to reach our wonderful presenters. If it's not in the Q&A, they're not going to see it. It's lost in the internet and we don't want that to happen. Now, if you want to reach me at any point throughout the next hour, I am your technical slash social support. Uh, go a little bit to the right to the chat box and I'll be monitoring that and, and checking out that chat box to help you out throughout this next hour. So Q&A for the wonderful presenters, chat box for myself. As mentioned, this is a webinar. You cannot be seen. You cannot be heard. I know it's a little rainy today. Uh, so if you guys are in your warm PJs, got a nice beverage, that's okay. We can't see you. But because that's the case, really the Q&A in the chat box is the only way that we can interact with each other. This is a webinar and it's recorded, so no need to take crazy notes writing down on your paper, typing out. Uh, I'll be sending out a recording of this presentation and the slides included in it at the end um, at the end of the presentation, so you'll be able to watch it to your heart's content. Now, finally, uh, if you have any questions, comments about anything after the presentation, please feel free to reach out to us at program at gildasclubtoronto.org that you see on the screen right there. Now, what you're actually here for is our wonderful presenters. We've got two today, Roshane Francis and Garrett Bolivant, and I will do a little bit of reading for you guys so we can learn about them. Now, Roshane Francis is a Sick Kids PhD graduate working as a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Party's lab at University of Toronto. During her PhD, Roshane studied how the embryonic stomach developed in mice and used these insights to study gastric cancer initiation. Wanting to explore more translation-specific opportunities, her postdoctoral studies involve engineering bacteria to secrete therapeutic compounds for the treatment of inflammatory bowel diseases. We also have Garrett Boulevant joining us today. Garrett received his BSc from McMaster University with an honors specialization in molecular biology and genetics. There, he began recognizing his interest in cancer research through an undergraduate thesis with Dr. John John Draper, his project focused on the canonical and non-canonical roles of TP53 in breast cancer. Currently, Garrett is pursuing his PhD in molecular genetics at the University of Toronto, working in the lab of Dr. Peter Dirks. His project is focused on glioblastoma, which is the most common primary malignant brain tumor. Specifically, he's looking at whether cellular differentiation can be harnessed as an alternative therapy to arrest glioblastoma growth. Garrett is passionate about sharing his expertise in cancer biology and mentoring young people interested in science. As such, Garrett has occupied the high school talks lead position since the 2019-2020 year. Now, that is enough for me. I'm going to throw it over to our wonderful presenters, and I'll see you guys in the chat boxes. Okay, I'm just going to quickly set this up and share. Um, sorry, just give me one second. Okay. okay, so hopefully you guys just see my slides and not all my notes. Perfect. Okay. So first, I'd like to thank everyone for being here and also for Gilda's Club for organizing this great seminar. And it's really great that they're putting out these series for uh, everyone to have a chance to learn about new topics in cancer research. And today, my colleague Garrett and I will be talking about immunotherapy and its implications and potential as a cancer treatment. Um, before we begin, just quickly, 
uh, what does RIDE stand for and who are we? So RIDE stands for the Research uh, Information Outreach Team. We're part of the Canadian Cancer Society. And what we do is that, that we present community and high school talks uh, on the progress and promise of cancer research. And uh, we also post uh, videos and blogs um, on, our, uh, on our blog uh, called torontoriot.com. And in more detail specifically, Garrett and I are actually cancer researchers and scientists, and we volunteer with the Canadian Cancer Society. And our goal is to share our knowledge of cancer and highlight the current research. Uh, however, we are not licensed medical professionals and we're not qualified to give any medical advice. So please consult with your family doctor oncologist for any questions pertaining to any specific medical cases. Okay, now that we have all the disclaimers and, uh, out of the way, um, I, th I thought it would be helpful today before we dive into the meat of our talk, uh, just to give a broad overview of what we're actually talking about today. So part of it is cancer and what the immune system does, and then how does cancer relate to the immune system? And then Garrett will talk about uh, immunotherapy, uh, the types of immunotherapy, some case studies, and then we'll end off with questions and discussions. Okay, so in order to understand cancer as a disease, um, that happens within different organs and tissues. Um, so like breast cancer or gastric cancer, we actually also need to understand, uh, we understand the disease also on a cellular level. That's what researchers do. And thus far, a lot of our understanding of what a cancer cell does is actually um, from studying what a normal cell does. Um, so in order to uh, understand what happens in cancer, it, it would be helpful to understand what normal cells do. So what exactly is a cell? So human tissues are composed of millions of cells and all cells have uh, basic functions. So this includes respiration where essentially um, well for oxygen, they then also produce energy to sustain themselves. They also have a waste removal system. And lastly, they also divide themselves or undergo cell division to maintain themselves. However, all the cells within our body are not the same. And this is evident, like you have skin cells, you have hair cells, uh, cells within your kidneys have very specific functions of, filter, of filtering. Um, but however, each cell be can become specialized to have different functions. Um, and in, within our organs and tissues, all of these cells work together and communicate with each other to uh, perform a certain function. And within these cells, um, as they age or as they divide, they all have a, cell, a system of checks and balances to make sure everything is moving uh, effectively. However, um, not all cells within our bodies um, have the same uh, function. Um, and when these uh, checks and balances fall, go awry, that's what leads to the formation of cancer cells. And cancer cells, basically, when they don't have these checks and balances, they, they don't know when they should stop dividing. Um, they cannot sense different cues from the environment. And then they don't undergo cell death. So when these cells, as shown in this image here, cannot uh, regulate their growth and their life cycle, they basically grow uncontrollably. And this leads to the formation of uh, tumors. And these are, uh, over here, we're showing you how a, um, you can have a benign uh, squamous carcinoma and eventually that can become uh, malignant by uh, invading deeper into the tissue. And this is when they grow into areas they shouldn't grow. So in very simple terms, um, cancer is the rapid and un is rapid and uncontrollable cell growth. So by studying cancer cells from different tissues, researchers have defined 10 unique traits or hallmarks of cancer cells. And we define these traits as the hallmarks of cancer. So if you look at different types of cancers from different organs and tissues, you'll notice that um, the way that they promote these un uncontrollable growth is through one of these um, traits. And one uh, hallmark that immunotherapy, which Garrett will get into more, but uh, aims to, uh, will help, uh, that aims to target is called, uh, is by, in, by uh, increasing Im the immune system recognition of cancer cells. And this way, immune, the immune system can target, can recognize and target our cells. So how, how is our immune system able to do this? So I thought it would be inter interesting to kind of throw this out to you guys, nations surrounding how the vaccine works with 
their immune system and how our immune system health protects us from uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. So I was just wondering if anyone, and maybe you can put this um, in the chat. Um, uh, you can put this in the chat. Um, if they had um, an idea of how they think the immune system works. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Yumna, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but yes, it is our body's natural defense system and it basically protects us from, um, oh, wow, that's great. Yes, it also does create antibodies, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so it protects us from, um, exactly, so viruses, bacteria, and parasites. Um, um, so yes, so it's very important that we have our immune system to help us um, be able to recognize like foreign entities such as virus, bacteria, or parasites, and basically determine that it's not part of yourself and uh, destroy these foreign invaders. So just to get... Um, a deeper or a quick understanding of what the immune system does, I thought it would be cool to look at this video. Um, so let's take a look. A mosquito lands on your arm, injects its chemicals into your skin and begins to feed. You wouldn't even hear a company for safeguard against infection, illness, disease. This system is a vast network of cells, issues, and or coordinate your body's defenses against any threats to your health. Without it, you'd be exposed to billions of bacteria, viruses, and toxins that could make something as minor as a paper cut or a seasonal cold fatal. The immune system relies on millions of defensive white blood cells, also known as leukocytes, that originate in our bone marrow. These cells migrate into the bloodstream and the lymphatic system, a network of vessels which helps clear bodily toxins and waste. Our bodies are teeming with leukocytes. There are between 4,000 and 11,000 in every microliter of blood. As they move around, leukocytes work like security personnel constantly screening the blood, tissues, and organs for suspicious signs. This system mainly relies on cues called antigens. Molecular traces on the surface of pathogens and other foreign substances betray the presence of invaders. As soon as the leukocytes detect them, it takes only minutes for the bonds to kick in. Threats to our bodies are hugely variable, so the immune response has to be equally adaptable. That means relying on many different types of leukocytes to tackle threats in different ways. Despite this diversity, we classify leukocytes in two main cellular groups, which coordinate a two-pronged attack. First, phagocytes trigger the immune response by sending macrophages and dendritic cells into the blood. As these circulate, they destroy any foreign cells they encounter simply by consuming them. That allows phagocytes to identify the antigen on the invaders they just ingested and transmit this information to the second major cell group orchestrating the defense, the lymphocytes. A group of lymphocyte cells called T cells go in search of infected body cells and swiftly kill them off. Meanwhile, B cells and helper T cells use the information gathered from the unique antigens to start producing special proteins called antibodies. This is the piece de resistance. Each antigen has a unique matching antibody that can latch onto it like a lock and key and destroy the invading cells. B cells can produce millions of these, which then cycle through the body and attack the invaders until the worst of the threat is neutralized. While all of this is going on, familiar symptoms like high temperatures and swelling are actually processes designed to aid the immune response. Harder for bacteria and viruses to reproduce and spread because they're temperature sensitive. And when body cells are damaged, they release chemicals that make fluid leak into the surrounding tissues, causing swelling. That also attracts phagocytes, which consume the invaders and the damaged cells. Usually, an immune response will eradicate a threat within a few days. 
It won't always stop you from getting ill, but that's not its purpose. Its actual job is to stop a threat from escalating to dangerous levels inside your body. And through constant surveillance over time, the immune system provides another benefit. It helps us develop long-term immunity. When B and T cells identify antigens, they can use that information to recognize invaders in the future. So when a threat revisits, the cells can swiftly deploy the right antibodies to tackle it before it affects any more cells. That's how you can develop immunity to certain diseases like chickenpox. Okay, um, I hope that video gave you kind of a quick overview of what the immune system does and the different players within the immune system. So interestingly, um, although the immune system can um, recognize virus, bacteria, and parasites, um, it can also um, recognize uh, cancer cells. And, and it can recognize cells that are behaving erratically, essentially, and target, recognize, and, and that is the, um, the basis for uh, immunotherapy. So this is just, um, and scientists, uh, this is some work done by scientists, but essentially interaction between an immune cell and a cancer cell, and they've depicted it here. So it, uh, essentially what I'm showing you here is on the leftmost panel is this huge uh, cancer cell, which is uh, being approached by a T cell, which is an immune cell, which has certain receptors on its surface that can recognize antigens or molecules present on a cancer cell, like specific to a cancer cell. And then essentially, um, once it recognizes the cancer cell, it releases chemicals, which will cause the cancer cell to eventually eradicate cancer cell, which you'll see here in the last panel. Um, and it, as I mentioned, this, this interaction is the basis for immunotherapy, where cancer cells to increase cancer cell death. So now I will pass um, on my talk. I will pass on um, this portion to Garrett, who will go into detail about immunotherapy, its history, and some case studies to better understand how it works. Thanks, everyone. Okay, um, Rashane, do you mind just uh, let me know if it uh, if the screen looks all right? Yep, screen's yeah, good. good. Cool. All right. Awesome. So I'm just going to kind of uh, continue off of where uh, where Rashane started. Um, so as was just described, um, the immune system um, is pretty effective um, at recognizing early cancer cells. So it does have this ability to recognize and destroy as they develop all the time. And in fact, if we didn't have an immune system, then we'd be developing cancer a lot more often. Role, and it makes sure that cellular mistakes are, are nipped in the bud before they can become too sinister. And so specifically, as Rishane was mentioning, it's these T cells um, that are responsible for patrolling the body. And so in the very early stages of cancer, um, our immune cells do a good job of killing individual cancer cells as they arise. And so this is known as the eliminating phase of cancer where immune cells are kind of able to keep the tumor in check and, and calmly carry out their function. Um, so some tumors can actually get fairly big, um, but still be kept in check by our immune cells. Um, and this process can actually last for years. Um, but as time goes on, uh, cancer cells can develop what are called genetic changes um, that can help them escape from the immune system. And this is what has been called the escape phase um, of tumor progression. Uh, they come up with these really ingenious ways of, of bio bypassing our immune cells um, and escaping their detection. And so as we can see um, on this, uh, this graphic here of the hallmarks of cancer, this really defines one of the hallmarks of cancer. And so it's the ability of cancer cells to um, eventually um, gain this ability to avoid the immune cells, which again, typically uh, of cancer are actually quite effective at, at kind of pruning away and become cancerous. And so how is it that cancer is actually able to escape these, uh, this, uh, this immune system and these immune cells? So there's kind of uh, four main different ways that they're able to escape um, uh, the immune. And so typically immune, just briefly in the video, typically immune cells recognize danger um, through a group of molecules 
molecules that exist on the surface of all cells in the body. And so the immune cells are able to use these molecules to inspect cells and basically decide whether uh, they need to attack them or if they're just normal cells. And so typically, um, immune cells would be able to tell that cancer cells are exhibiting um, foreign molecules and would know that they should be removed. Um, but when a cancer reaches that escape phase of tumor progression, it can change. And the molecules that would otherwise reveal the cancer to the immune cells are lost. And thus those killer T cells that we talked about um, would kind of just unknowingly pass by these cancer cells um, without the knowledge um, of what sort of damage these cells could cause. So that's one of the ways, and that's the, the loss of recognition signals that cancer cells would normally display. Um, additionally, cancer cells can also develop ways um, to basically inactivate immune cells um, by producing molecules that make them stop working. So specifically, the cancer cells can send suppressive signals to immune cells um, that just basically tell them to, to, to leave them alone, ultimately. And so that's the, the second uh, uh, mechanism that, um, that cancer cells can, uh, can take advantage of. Um, cancer cells also can change the local environment. Um, so the environment around the tumor can be changed by cancer cells. And so ultimately, cancer cells are, are very greedy um, um, in terms of energy consumption. Um, so ultimately, they can basically make the, the environment a hostile, hostile place for immune cells to work um, by depleting all the essential nutrients, um, ultimately making it inhospitable for, for immune cells. Um, so the immune cells won't even go near the, uh, the tumor uh, because there just isn't enough nutrients for them to function correctly. And finally, there are also physical barriers. Um, so the architecture specifically of some solid tumors um, really prevents immune cells from actually being able to enter um, and survey the tumor. So there's kind of these four main ways, again, um, that as cancer progresses, they kind of are endowed with these abilities to, uh, to avoid the immune system. And so that kind of uh, leads us well into this idea of immunotherapy. And so broadly, immunotherapy is the treatment of disease um, by activating or suppressing the immune system. So that's a very broad definition that um, kind of uh, goes outside of the scope of just cancer um, because immunotherapy is actually used for multiple diseases um, outside of cancer. But if we're talking about the context of cancer specifically, um, cancer immunotherapy is intended to uh, boost the immune system and ultimately help immune systems um, find cancer and attack it. The rationale behind cancer immunotherapy is that if there's a way to reverse the tricks um, that cancer cells use or to stop immune cells from falling for them, um, then their cancer fighting ability uh, might be restored. And so I'm not going to get uh, too bogged down on the history of immunotherapy, but I think it's kind of interesting to just touch on some of the uh, kind of the, some of the seminal uh, findings throughout the years. Um, so, I mean, myself included, and, and a lot of people I've spoken to often think that immunotherapy is a very recent medical achievement, maybe originating no, um, no later than maybe a couple of decades ago. Uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, the very beginning of immunotherapy can be uh, traced back to uh, China's Jin Dynasty um, around the third century BC. And it was likely the first example of the purposeful inoculation um, with variola minor virus to prevent smallpox. So again, not cancer immunotherapy, but one of the first um, kind of cases of immunotherapy, which again is just boosting the immune system for treatment of disease. Um, and so we can touch more here on the actual cancer immunotherapy breakthroughs. Um, the first kind of well-documented example of inoculating patients for treatment of cancer was actually in 1888 um, by P. Bruins, who injected a patient with streptococcus um, and noticed a shrinkage of their malignancy. Um, in, 19, sorry, in 1898, um, the father of immunotherapy, uh, William Coley, had generated what he termed a toxin solution that really consisted of inactivated bacterial species, uh, which he was able to demonstrate effective in treating some cancers. Uh, by the end of his career, he had treated almost 1,000 cases of cancer. Um, in 1957, the immunosurveillance hypothesis was proposed. And so this was the first time that people speculated that lymphocytes in your body are actually, able, or are actually capable um, of recognizing and eliminating um, cancer cells um, constantly as they're arising. Um, so that was a really huge finding and, and kind of changed the way that we see the immune system. Um, in 1973, uh, dendritic cells were identified, um, which we touched briefly on in that video. And again, those are the cells that are really instrumental in actually recognizing cancer cells um, and telling your T cells um, which cells are cancerous. Um, in 2011, uh, the first John followed by the first CAR T cell therapy in 20 words that uh, maybe you haven't heard of before, but uh, we'll touch on those uh, two forms of cancer immunotherapy in a little bit more detail in a few slides. And then finally, um, kind of most recently, um, in 2018, uh, the Nobel Prize was actually awarded for, uh, for the discovery of checkpoint inhibitors, um, which are uh, really remarkable and 
uh, have really kind of made strides in uh, the treatment of some, some types of cancer. Okay, so now that we have others, um, maybe within the last 10 years, really picked up. Um, so the research into immunotherapy has really exploded. Um, and really that's largely due to um, some very promising clinical data. Um, specifically, um, immunotherapy has been shown to achieve complete and durable remission in some patients uh, with cancers that were previously considered uncurable. Um, and we'll touch on some of those case examples. Um, so to, de to de demonstrate, sorry, this surge in immunotherapy research, um, we can just look at the publications, um, the research publications from uh, 2013 to 2018 um, have nearly doubled. Um, furthermore, there's about, uh, or there's over 400 ongoing immunotherapy clinical trials in, in Canada. Um, so clearly uh, there's a big um, push for immunotherapy, both in the research world um, and also on the clinical side. Um, which are, are, are both very um, kind of uh, cooperative with one another. So they, they go hand in hand. Um, what's quite interesting though is, sorry, there's actually only six active immunotherapies that have been approved for cancer. And so that means based on this uh, number of clinical trials, um, that there's actually hundreds of other new and promising uh, cancer immunotherapies um, that are only available in clinical trials. Um, so this is just something to note um, that, uh, just to, to be cognizant of, of the fact that there are clinical trials ongoing, um, only three to 6% of patients, um, of cancer patients who are eligible for clinical trials actually participate. Um, so it means that who, who may be eligible for clinical trials. And we, we mentioned at the start of this, uh, this talk that uh, we're not clinicians and we don't give up medical advice, but I think it's important just for uh, people to educate themselves and um, what's really interesting is you can look at clinical trials, trials that are ongoing um, at Canadian, canadiancancertrials.ca. Um, so just uh, kind of some, some, some food, to, food for thought. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on the uh, so three of kind of the main immunotherapies that are um, kind of in, in the clinic right now um, or, or in development and, and soon to be in the clinic. Um, so those are checkpoint inhibitors, um, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy, and <clears throat> finally, CAR T cells. And so we'll start with the, um, the, uh, the, I guess, the winner of the Nobel Prize, the checkpoint inhibitors. Sorry, one second. Um, so just a, a, a very basic, um, this is glossing over a lot of the complexity behind um, immune cell interaction. Um, but ultimately, we know that the T cells are the main players in the body for for finding cancer cells. Um, so the T cell finds a cancer cell, but as we, we learned, cancer cells have these ways of avoiding the immune system. So the cancer cell exhibits a stop signal um, to stop the activity of the immune cell. And we can see that here with the purple and red interaction. Um, but checkpoint inhibitors, what they're capable of doing um, is basically releasing this stop signal. So they're able to um, basically interrupt the interaction between the T cell um, and the cancer cell that would normally prevent the T cell from, from acting. Um, and this ultimately allows, allows immune cells to function correctly and allows them to um, eliminate the cancer cells. Um, so a, a very um, basic uh, description of it, but uh, um, it's really just uh, basically the breaking of a, an interaction between a cancer cell and a T cell that allows the T cell to function as it should and, and how it's trained to, to function. Um, so a great example of this, probably the most popular example um, of checkpoint inhibitor success um, is in former U.S. President Jimmy Carter. So in 2015, um, at the age of 91, uh, Carter announced that he had stage four uh, melanoma in his liver and brain. Um, so he was treated with radiation and also um, the immunotherapy drug uh, Keytruda. And so he now says he's cancer-free and no longer needs treatment, although he's uh, continually being monitored. Um, and so uh, radiation therapy, I won't touch on too much, but um, Keytruda, the drug that, uh, um, the immunotherapy drug, um, basically allowed his immune system to attack melanoma cells. So melanoma cells are hiding from the immune system <clears throat> by, exp by expressing a protein called PD-1. And so um, if we we'll go back, maybe a slide, um, we can envision PD-1 basically being this purple, um, purple uh, little protein here, or molecule here on the cancer cell. Um, so the cancer cell exhibits that protein PD-1 to prevent this, uh, this interaction between the T cell and the cancer cell. <clears throat> and so this drug, uh, Keytruda, basically um, interrupts that interaction be between uh, PD-1 and the immune cell. Um, and so the use of this drug has actually increased survival 
um, from months to uh, to about three years. And so a, a another uh, very different type of uh, therapy, um, uh, immunotherapy, um, is cell transfer. It's called tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. <clears throat> and so, as we've discussed, cancer patients have these naturally occurring T cells circulating in their body that have some anti-tumor effects. However, we also know that the existence of these T cells alone isn't always enough to eliminate tumors. And so we know that T cells can have their activity suppressed. And additionally, there, there may not exist enough uh, T cells to elicit an effective immune response. And so um, TIL therapy uh, aims to overcome these hurdles. And so during TIL therapy, what happens is the T cells are actually harvested from the patient's tumor. And they're then taken and, uh, and cultured in the lab. And what happens there is the, the cells are actually activated. And so they're, they're activated to overcome those, express, uh, those suppressive signals that have been imposed by the cancer cells. And then they're expanded to large numbers. And once we have that large number of T cells, they can be reinfused back into that same patient where they're then going to be more effective at seeking out and destroying the tumor. <clears throat> so that's one form of what's called adoptive cell transfer. I'm called such because you're adopting your own T cells and, and then injecting them back into your body. Um, a arguably more effective adoptive cell transfer, um, but of, of course a more expensive um, therapy is what's called the um, CAR T cell therapy. And so um, as the same implies, this also the backbone of this therapy are the T cells. Um, and so similar to TIL therapy, um, CAR T cell therapy, requires drawing blood from the patients and, the, and then uh, separating out the T cells. However, in CAR T cell therapy, the T cells are genetically engineered to produce receptors on their surface um, called chimeric antigen receptors or CARs. And so these receptors are synthetic molecules and they don't actually exist naturally. Thus, this therapy doesn't rely on the native function of the patient's T cells um, like we did in the uh, TIL therapy, but instead um, we're able to kind of supercharge these T cells with these CARs. And so these special receptors allow the T cells to recognize and attach to a specific protein um, or antigen, which is a word that we threw out um, earlier in the presentation, um, on the tumor cells. And so the CAR T cell therapy that's kind of furthest along in development um, targets an antigen found on cancer called uh, CD19. And so once the collected T cells have been engineered um, to basically express this um, antigen-specific um, chimeric, chimeric antigen receptor, um, they're then expanded in the lab, again, similarly to TIL therapy, and again, reinfused back into the same patient. And so with guidance from this engineered receptor, um, these CAR T cells, um, that, that antigen on their surface. And so um, are arguably a much more technically challenge because they have to be genetically engineered, um, but um, they... Uh, have seemingly had more um, success in, 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 uh, in, in clinical trials. And so in 2017, <clears throat> two CAR cell T therapies were approved um, by the FDA, one for the treatment of children with acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia and the other for adults uh, with advanced lymphomas. And so we can show an example um, of this, a, a case study of this actually, um, in um, a case of, uh, in this case of um, lymphoblastic leukemia. And so uh, we see here um, an example in a patient uh, called Emily who had uh, leukemia in 2012. And so she was treated with, uh, with CAR T therapy. So she had her um, cells removed, her T cells removed um, and then engineered and, and reinfused into her body. Um, so as expected, um, Emily developed a high fever after infusion, which is a symptom of the cytoc cyto uh, cytokine storm um, as her newly powerful immune system uh, attacked her cancer. She was actually put on a ventilator for two weeks as her clinical team watched her closely, um, but was later actually uh, declared cancer-free and has been since. And so um, beautifully, she was actually uh, with her father as he spoke at the FDA approval hearing for CAR T-cell therapy, um, which again was approved in, uh, in 2017. Um, so uh, yeah, some, some really um, incredible therapies um, that have um, all just hinged on uh, taking advantage of our um, existing immune system. Um, with that being said, there's, there's of course, limitations uh, to these therapies. Um, one of the main ones uh, is the inefficient production cost. And so this doesn't ring as true for, um, for checkpoint inhibitors, which are typically um, drugs, but um, for those cases of adoptive cell transfer, um, they can be prohibitively expensive um, because 
Um, in, in, in the case of drugs, you can often uh, mass produce them um, at scale, and it can be something that can actually be feasible. But with adoptive cell transfer, you need to um, basically culture one person's um, individualized uh, T cells, which is extremely expensive um, and laborious. So that uh, is a big challenge for, um, for some of the immunotherapies. There's some cancers that are just extremely hard to treat, um, specifically solid tumors, um, where the immune, uh, the immune cells aren't able to actually um, kind of uh, get into the tumor. Um, so that's, that's another uh, challenge here with immunotherapies. It's also um, with patients who seemingly have the same cancer, there are certain patients who just seem to respond and others who don't seem to respond um, for seemingly unknown reasons. Uh, researchers are trying really hard to find clinical markers that are able to differentiate the two um, patient groups and stratify them. So we're not wasting uh, money on patients who are not going to respond to those immunotherapies. <clears throat> There's, of course, uh, side effects. Um, so I touched on that briefly with Emily, um, but this idea of the cytokine release syndrome. So as part of their immune-related duties, uh, those T cells, they release cytokines, which are chemical messengers that help to stimulate this. Um, there's rapid and massive release of cytokines in the bloodstream, which can lead to dangerously high fevers um, and, and really dangerous drops in blood pressure. So there are um, uh, side effects associated with these therapies um, that need to be um, kind of weighed. Um, of course, the level of scientific understanding is going to um, limit um, the progress of, of research and, and subsequently um, clinical trials. Um, and then another major limitation is this uh, delay in translating science to clinic. Um, and so that's another good segue into talking about this. Um, it's another good segue into talking about uh, the fact that there's just so many immunotherapy clinical trials um, going on globally. <clears throat> Sorry, so if I'm talking about this, uh, this limitation um, being this delay in translating science to clinic, um, what would help um, move um, a lot of these um, experimental uh, treatments into clinic is by recruiting more patients for clinical trials, um, because that's um, oftentimes a, a rate limiting step. And so it's just another a good opportunity to mention the fact that, the, the, again, there are um, over 6,000 immunotherapy clinical trials going on globally, and we can see here in Canada, um, over 400. Um, and again, just to note uh, that these can be viewed um, and um, kind of researched on, on your own at canadiancancertrials.ca. Um, yeah, and uh, just, uh, I think it's just important to be, uh, to be educated for sure. Um, with that, uh, I think we'll just touch on <clears throat> some resources and ongoing trials in Canada. Um, so the major trials um, in Canada generally exist at or Princess Margaret uh, Cancer Center here in, in, in Toronto. Um, at the BC Cancer Foundation, um, and also at Ottawa Hospital. There are some collaborative programs uh, that um, operate either nationally or globally um, to basically pair uh, researchers with clinicians. And so there's the Biotherapeutics for Cancer Treatment and also the Canadian Cancer Immunotherapy Consortium, which have done an um, amazing job at uh, moving some of these clinical trials forward. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, um, I'd just like to thank everyone And, and for everyone's attention uh, and following uh, advantage in general. Uh, we sometimes talk about immunotherapy. We sometimes talk about just cancer in general. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and we also have a, uh, a website where we, uh, we post blogs. But yeah, just uh, thanks everyone for your attention. Um, I see there's a lot of traffic in the Q&A and chat, so I'm happy to, to get to that. Awesome, thank you so much, guys. Uh, let me give a big, big, big thank you to Roshane, who has since left us, but after her wonderful first half of the presentation, thank you, Garrett, for a wonderful second half of the presentation, and thank you, Pinjal, for your little behind-the-scenes work answering all those questions like a speedy little mouse. Good. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we will give you guys, er, everybody that's present, a couple of minutes to ask any questions if you have anything that you'd like to ask. Uh, so while anybody might be typing away into the Q&A, I would like to direct your attention to the chat box for the real reason that everybody showed up today, which is this wonderful survey link that I've put in the chat box. So we really appreciate everybody taking the time to fill out a survey to let us know what you think about the presentation, um, what you like, what you don't like, what you wish was here, what you wish for future presentation topics. We do share the results with our presenters and with the Gildas team so that we can cater our 
programming to you and make sure that's what you actually want to see and show up for. Uh, the survey is 100% totally anonymous. So please feel free and thank you in advance for taking like two minutes out of your day to finish that up. Um, I'm not seeing anything rolling in the Q&A though. So I'll give it a couple more seconds. Maybe someone's just finishing up a typing. Uh, like I said, this has been recorded. You will be getting an email from myself with the recording, with the survey link again, just in case you forget it. Um, and also with a link to our future upcoming education sessions, if there are any other topics you're interested in, which I have also popped in the chat box right there. Uh, so thank you again to everybody for showing up today, for all the participants, for uh, all of our viewers today. Thank you again, Garrett, Kinjal, Roshane. It's been wonderful. Uh, and that's all from us. I hope you all have a great evening. See ya.